Hey everybody, this is Mr. Gunnell, and today I'm going to walk you through our second lesson on uh, graphing for simple harmonic motion. So the IB objective we're looking at today is sketching and interpreting graphs of simple harmonic motion examples. Uh, I'm going to walk you through one example and hopefully that'll help you understand what we should do when we're graphing anything for simple harmonic motion. So the example I want to look at is if we have a mass that's attached to two springs, uh, it's oscillating back and forth, and we're going to assume that the time whenever we're making a graph start uh, the mass has already been oscillating back and forth, or maybe it was given a little bit of a push, uh, but at a time of zero, it's passing through the equilibrium position and moving to the left. So whether it was moving before that or not doesn't really matter. That's when we're going to start looking at it for our graphs. And we're going to graph several different graphs. Uh, there's going to be a total of six, uh, or actually seven, because we're going to make one that's not time-based. And so we're going to look at this oscillator. So you can see the mass is attached to two springs. We see that it's oscillating back and forth between uh, positive x and negative x, and remember that also that when we look at that uh, maximum position, we could even call it xo or negative xo, because xo stands for the amplitude. And so if we make a graph of, let's start with position first, and we're going to look at where that's at with time. And so we said in the question that the time of zero, it was passing through the center. And I always like to, when I'm making a graph, think about four different locations. Uh, and those four different locations are, or, or four different time locations, you know, each quarter of a period. So we know that when something's oscillating, what it's going to do is it's going to start somewhere. It's in the question listed as going to the left first. So it's going to go there. It's going to come back. It's going to go through the center all the way over to the other amplitude and then come back. And that's one full oscillation. So if we track kind of at the, as that path is moving along, I would pick those four locations in those four times. Here's the beginning. Here is one quarter of the way through the period. Halfway through the period, it's back to its center again. Three quarters of a period, it's to the other side. And then one full period is back to the center. Because if you remember, a period is one full back and forth motion. Um, just one side doesn't really count. So we always want to make sure that we're thinking about that when we're graphing this. So uh, like I said, let's think about the position. And also when I mark position, I like to mark my maximums. And that's uh, also a good way to think about how to graph is the maximum position we said was the amplitude. So we call that XO and down here would be negative XO. So uh, like we said in the question, at a time of zero, the position is uh, right in the center at equilibrium. So I'm gonna graph that, I'm gonna make a dot there uh, at the origin. Now, if we think about it after a quarter of a period, it was moving to the left, so it gets all the way to the left side, and it gets to its maximum uh, displacement at a quarter of a period. So I'm going to mark that down here at negative XO. And so you can see on my time axis, uh, I put T and 2T, so that's one period and two full periods. And we're going to kind of graph that each quarter of a period is listed along the axis. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, as I mentioned before, halfway through its period, now it's returned to the middle. So I'm going to mark its location at x equals 0 again. Uh, and then 3 quarters of a period, it's gone through the middle. It's made it all the way over to the right side. So now it's at the other side, and it's at its maximum uh, displacement again, but now to the right. And then one full period again, we mentioned that it's back to the center. So I'm going to mark a, a dot there at 0 again. Uh, and then it's going to repeat the same thing. So we would see that happening really kind of uh, over again. So I'm not going to re-explain that. But it would happen again for that second period. And if you notice what's happening is we really get what's uh, really just kind of a negative sine wave. And, you know, it's because of the changing acceleration, it's not going to be a, a straight line. If you remember back to our lessons on position time graphs, the only time you get a straight line is when it's a constant speed. And so that's why this is going to be a nice sine curve. And we'll see how good I am at actually drawing a sine curve freehand. Um, but we'd want to connect. And again, I'm really kind of using all those individual points to think about when it's at these different locations. And there we go. So that's what our graph of position versus time would look like. Uh, if you think back to what we talked about yesterday, the period, remember, has to stay the same for simple harmonic oscillators. So the time it takes for one period is the same as two periods. And also the amplitude stays the same. It doesn't get any shorter as time goes on. Uh, 
because uh, we're assuming that there's no friction. So if you remember back to what we were learning with kinematics, uh, you know that the next graph we're going to make is a velocity time graph. And when we go from a position time graph to a velocity time graph, we need to think again about the slope of the graph, or at the IB we call it the gradient of the graph, telling us what the next graph would look like. Uh, if you're in calc, you would just think about this as a derivative. So I'm going to use the slope of the line of the position graph to help me figure out what should be on the velocity graph. So if I look at each individual spot, um, again, let's start at the beginning. So if I look here at the position graph, uh, I notice that it's got a pretty negative slope. Or if I draw on a tangent line to the graph there, I'm going to see that it's the most negative that that graph is going to be. And so what I can do is that I can say, all right, well, that's my most negative velocity. So down here on the velocity graph, I'm going to draw in um, negative Vmax to represent the maximum negative velocity it can have, and then Vmax, which is the highest velocity it could have, but in the positive direction. And so if we look at those individual points, again, at the first spot, it's the most negative, so I'll put my dot there. And then when we approach a quarter of a period, we notice that that line really flattens out, and it's a tangent there. Uh, or the, the line that is a tangent flattens out, so that tells me that my velocity is zero at that point. And then I can keep going along this graph and looking at all these locations. Uh, if at a half of a period, we've got a nice line there that's pretty steep, but now in the positive direction. So that's the highest uh, positive velocity that I've gotten. And then again, now at three quarters of a period, we've reached a, a flat line again. So we know our velocity is zero. And then a period, we're back down to a negative velocity again. So I'm going to go zero and negative again. And one thing we can check too is if we look at these two points, we should see that we return to the same thing that we were doing before to get through one full period or one full cycle. Uh, and again, the same thing is going to happen for the next time around. And I'm just going to draw those again. I'm not going to re-explain that whole process. Uh, you can go back if you missed any part of that. And then again, we're going to uh, connect those. This time we have a negative cosine graph. missed that one. And then we finish off looks like that. So again, one thing that I mentioned before is that if you're in calculus, uh, I said that you know you take the derivative and some of you may notice that the first graph is a negative sine graph for the position and then the second graph is going to be a negative cosine graph. So that should follow your rules for taking the time derivative uh, of that graph. If you're not in calculus, then again we just think about the slope or the gradient of the graph at any one point. And then, no surprise, when we go from a velocity graph to an acceleration graph, we take the slope again. And so that's how we think about getting the acceleration. If you're in calc, again, we just take the derivative of the velocity graph or the second derivative of the position graph. Now, that calculus connection is not required for IB physics, but it does help if you're in, uh, if you're in both classes to kind of think about how these two things relate. Uh, just like we did before, I'm going to mark my maximum location. So where is the acceleration the most? And then where is it the most negative? Then I'm just going to call those A max and negative A max. So we notice that if we look at the velocity graph, the place where there's no acceleration is right when we start. So the slope of that line or the slope of the tangent line to that graph would be zero at that point. So my initial acceleration is zero. And we should also always kind of think about how that relates to our oscillator, is that if we look back at the beginning, we said it was passing through the origin or passing through its equilibrium position. So at this point, when it's passing through the middle, the springs should be at a point where they're balanced and there's no net force. So that should make sense that we're starting out with no acceleration. And so I'm going to start again with that having an acceleration of zero, and then we'll just keep moving along my different points on the graph. So at this point on the velocity graph, We've got a nice positive velocity, and so that's going to be up there. Uh, at the next point, here we've got a velocity um, that's maximum, but also it's a flat tangent, so our acceleration is going to be zero. Here we've got a negative, uh, negative slope on our velocity graph, so that's going to be a negative acceleration. And then at the full period, we're back to zero again.
And so I'm going to get rid of these dots or these circles. And we can see now we're back to a sine graph, but this time it's positive. And I'm going to just repeat those. And then sketch in our graph. That was definitely not my best work. And one thing to think about here also is we talked yesterday about how the acceleration should be proportional to the displacement and in the opposite direction. So if we look back to our uh, initial graph, now we got the acceleration graph by taking the, the slope of tangent lines to the velocity graph. But again, when we think about this equation, acceleration is proportional to negative x. We should see that basically if it's proportional, it should be the same type of graph, but it should be negative, so it should be flipped. So here we have a positive sine graph, and if we look back to our position graph, we should see that that was a negative sine graph. Now, I'm not saying that these are the same exact values for the highest and lowest because we're, they're two different things. One's an acceleration and one's a position. Um, but we should definitely always make sure we think about that connection that the acceleration is proportional to displacement. So if it's a sine graph, it's going to be a sine graph again. But that negative means it's going to be inverted. So uh, again, we had a negative sine graph for position. We have a positive sine graph for acceleration. And that's the whole idea behind simple harmonic motion is that they should be uh, directly uh, opposite for acceleration and displacement. Great. So the next thing that I want to look at, uh, now that we've looked at all the position, velocity, and acceleration graphs, uh, again, that should bring back some good memories from kinematics, uh, is the kinetic energy. So the best way to think about a kinetic energy graph is to take and think about its formula as 1 half mv squared. So since the kinetic energy is related to its velocity, we'd want to think about uh, just using the velocity graph to help us. Or we could also think about where it's got the most velocity. So if I think back to the spring oscillator, if we go back up here, um, if it's moving through the middle, it's always moving the fastest through the middle either direction. And then it stops when it gets to the end so it can turn around. So I want to think about if it's moving here, it's going to be going the fastest at first. It's going to go over here and slow down and stop. Come back around, it's going to be going the fastest now the other way. And then it's going to go over here and come back and stop. And then it's going to come back over here and back to the middle again where it's going the fastest again. And so I always want to trace out that path of a full cycle. Now if I think about the velocity graph, that should help me out too, because at the beginning, it's got a really big velocity. Uh, it happens to be negative, but since kinetic energy is a scalar, and since we're squaring the velocity anyways over here, uh, it shouldn't really matter if we're you know, a positive or negative velocity anyways. Kinetic energy being a scalar, that means we can only use positive values. So at time of zero, uh, and I'll make a little mark over here for uh, EK max, EK max for the highest possible kinetic energy. And it's going to start at that because it was moving through the middle at the beginning. It doesn't always have to be moving through the middle, uh, but in this case it is. And that's a little sloppy, so I'll fix that. And then there's going to be a little bit of going back and forth here. I'll try to show both on the same page at the same time. So the next part we look at is that the velocity uh, and I'm not looking at the slope anymore, I'm just seeing what the velocity is. So at this point, the velocity is zero. And so I'm going to make a mark for zero kinetic energy. And then here we have the same value of velocity. Uh, it just happens to be positive instead of negative. But again, since we're using v squared, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to end up with the same kinetic energy going through the oscillation one direction as we would the other. Uh, and again, because that's a scalar and because we're squaring the velocity. So that's just going to keep repeating. We just have a lot of kinetic energy and no kinetic energy, and a lot, and then none, and then a lot, and then none, and then a lot. So that's just going to make our graph look kind of like this. I'm probably making my dots a little bit too big, because those don't really need to be on the final graph. Um, but when I actually connect those, it's going to look kind of like a, a sine or cosine, but it's just it's all in the positive direction. Oops, I'm erasing when I should be drawing. <laughs> 
And so our kinetic energy graph should look something like this. Now, one thing to notice too about this is that it's going through what almost looks like two full cycles in one period. So whereas our other graphs, when we looked at this section, that might have looked like a period for our other graphs, but it's really just the kinetic energy becoming a, a maximum twice. So don't let that confuse you that we're still one full period, even though the kinetic energy looks like it's going through two cycles. I'm gonna get rid of these because these are not necessary. Uh, and then of course the next graph, if we look at that one, uh, is gonna be the potential energy. Same thing as before, the potential energy is a, uh, a scalar, so we're not gonna get any negative values. And so let's keep the theme going of different colors here. So I've got now a potential energy maximum. There's a couple ways you can think about this. Uh, one of them is that we can think about the kinetic energy graph. And we know that for something that's not affected by any outside or unbalanced forces, um, the total energy of that system is gonna stay the same. So when we have a maximum kinetic energy, there really shouldn't be any potential energy. Uh, we can also think about the way that we calculate potential energy for a spring, which is EP equals one half KX squared. And so since we're dealing in this case with the position, it's gonna follow a very similar rule to what we just did with the kinetic energy graph, but we're gonna look this time, instead of the velocity graph, we're gonna look at the position graph. And so I'd follow those same rules as we did before, where we have in the middle, the springs we assume are at equilibrium, so there's no potential energy. Uh, and then here we have a lot of potential because there's a, a large displacement. Same thing with the velocity graph, even though it's negative, it's squared, so that's not gonna matter. And then we have a zero, and then we have a lot, and then we have a zero again, and then we have a lot, and then zero. And just gonna keep going through that same uh, repeating cycle. So now that we're down here again at the beginning, you might have to go back to that video if you missed that. Um, it's not stretched at the beginning. Uh, so I'm gonna put it at zero and then it's got a lot, nothing. And we're just gonna draw those points that we talked about before. You might want to, in your notes, look back at your graphs since the video is a little hard to look at both at the same time. And we're gonna be going through that same repeating cycle. Now, if you look at as I'm drawing this, the graph right above, it should be a direct mirror of what's happening with your kinetic energy. And again, that's because our total energy should always stay the same. So for example, if we pick you know, this point here, we've got no kinetic, but we've got a lot of potential. That's at one and three quarters of a period. So always make sure that that is something that you're thinking about when you're going through these. Uh, and notice that there are multiple ways of uh, figuring out what that graph should look like. Now, the last one, uh, again, I've kind of already mentioned this, is that the total energy is really a combination of our kinetic and our potential. And so if we look at the total energy, that's just gonna be the same maximum value. Uh, and it might not even make sense to call it ET max, it's just the, the total mechanical energy. And we know that that should stay exactly the same as time goes on. And so I'm just gonna draw a flat line across there from zero to 2t. And if you look at any one point, uh, again, if there's a lot of potential, there's no kinetic. Even at points in between, if I look at this point and this point, it's got a little bit of a mix of both. And so you would just combine those and still get the same total as time goes on. Uh, so your ET is gonna just be your kinetic energy plus your potential energy at any one time. And so, again, just to refresh, uh, this EP is 1 half kx squared. We can use the graph from up above. Um, the EK, again, we use that as 1 half mv squared. And then the other graphs, again, we use, for these ones, we use the slopes to go from one graph to the next. Or again, if you're in calc, you can think about the derivatives. And then the last graph that I want to look at is energy, but not in relation to time, in relation to position. So as we've got that block moving back and forth, so it's going in uh, oscillations through the equilibrium. And at equilibrium, we would say that that's x equals zero. And then over on one side, we have xo, and then the other side, we have negative xo. 
And we had mentioned before that the place where it's moving the fastest is through the middle. It's got the most velocity uh, back and forth. And then it stops at either end in order to turn around. And so when we think about what type of energy it, have, it has, let's um, keep the same colors we've been using. So kinetic, I'll look at the orange line. So the kinetic would be quite a bit in the middle and actually the most when it's in the middle. So I'm gonna make a dot here for an energy, oops, energy at zero of a maximum kinetic energy. And then I'd also say that at the ends, it has no kinetic energy. Uh, now again, because we're not uh, a linear relationship between where you're at and how much kinetic energy it has, and same thing with potential, this is not gonna be a straight line, it's gonna be a curve. And so we're gonna look at the graph kind of like this. It's not perfectly symmetrical, but you get the idea of what it should be. Maybe I should fix that. It looks a little better. So that's what we would look at with velocity. Now, if we look, or I'm sorry, with uh, kinetic energy, so I'm gonna call that line EK. Um, and that's what the kinetic energy would be at any time between, um, or not any time, at any location. Uh, because we're graphing position this time instead of time. And then we can also look at what we did with potential energy. And again, because the potential energy, basically just the, the flipped version of the kinetic, uh, when we look at EP, we're going to say that that's the most at the ends. And since it has the same total, we're going to draw a dot all the way up at the top at the ends. And it has no potential in the middle because we assume that the springs are not stretched or at that equilibrium position, your delta x would be zero. And so this would be exactly the opposite. I'm gonna get rid of this because I don't think that's very helpful. And again, we would call this EP. And then if we wanted to add that line for total energy, we know that that should be the same everywhere. So I could draw a third line on there right across the top showing that the total energy does not change no matter where it's at, and so you might call that ET. Notice I'm not drawing arrows or I'm not extending the lines past those points because really the, the furthest it can go is negative XO or positive XO. And that is really everything, and I hope that helps you understand some of the graphing that we do uh, with energy for something that's oscillating in a simple harmonic motion.